Now the Tenderloin Borders, Mission, and Market Street is sheltered by Knob Hill. It's got a great history, survived the California Gold Rush. Anybody hip to the Maltese Falcon? Remember that? Hey, the writer used to live right up the street, Dashiell Hammett. Hello everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us for another Tenderloin Museum virtual event. We certainly miss seeing you at the Tenderloin Museum and we hope that you're staying safe. We are honored today to have two Tenderloin Museum board members joining us. Randy Shaw is a founder of the Tenderloin Museum and the executive director and founder of the Tenderloin Housing Clinic. Uh, Kathy Looper is our board president and the executive director of Reality House West. Kathy and her husband, Leroy Luther, purchased and renovated the Cadillac Hotel in 1977, which has become the model for supportive housing on the West Coast. So both of them have been leaders in the Tenderloin for over 40 years, and we're very excited to welcome them both today. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will uh, turn things over to Randy. And somebody pointed out there might be a little bit of feedback. Maybe we can, I don't know how to go with feedback, but. Uh... Um, well, if you're not speaking, you could mute yourself and then be sure to unmute yourself before you talk. That's a way that we could help with. It. That's pretty much our only option for helping with the feedback. Okay, thank you. Well, I thank everyone for joining us. You know, uh, when people don't often know what the history of a tenor and how it relates to what we're going through now. And so, when we were dealing with this initial start of the pandemic and we saw the tents multiplying, I thought, boy, this is just the latest example of City Hall attacking the Tenderloin. And you know, if you study neighborhoods and cities across the nation, almost always you see the function of city government to try to improve neighborhoods and support neighborhoods. Now there was urban renewal in the 60s, which demolished things, but supposedly that was supposed to improve it. The Tenderloin is rare in that we have City Hall continually doing things to wreck it. And uh, what I'm about to sort of the, the, the sort of the brief summary I'm about to give, it's, I re really recommend people pick up my book on the Tenderloin, the Tenderloin Sex Crime and Resistance in the Heart of San Francisco, because I expand upon all these themes, which is that after the earthquake of 1906, the earthquake and fire, the, the Tenderloin was primarily overwhelmingly rebuilt entirely from 1907 to 1930. And starting right with 1907 and 1908, the Tenderloin was booming. We were one of the most prosperous neighborhoods, not just in San Francisco, but in the United States. The finest restaurants on the West Coast were in the Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco. One of them was at the Great American, current Great American Music Hall. Mason Street had fantastic restaurants like the Black Cat, which the current Black Cat is named after. And so the Tenderloin was booming. So you think, well, that's what's wrong with that, this economy. Well, the problem was there were activities in the Tenderloin that the religious community didn't really like. Uh, there was gambling and there was prostitution. And that wasn't acceptable by the elite in San Francisco. So they mounted a huge campaign, which I discussed in the book in an entire chapter. Like it's hard to believe if you didn't have the newspaper articles to prove it. They actually mounted a campaign to close down the Tenderloin one of the most prosperous neighborhoods in the country. And they succeeded. And in 1917, suddenly one day, every business in the Tenderloin was closed down. And they thought, okay, great. Now we can have a whole new neighborhood. It'll be all different. We've prevailed. And of course, by 1918, 1919, we'd already come back because they miscalculated one critical thing, which was that once you had prohibition, and bars were illegal for everybody. It was the wild, wild west again, and those were the tenderloin, that's what made the tenderloin great, the, the underground economy. So we survived that, tenderloin's booming, the roaring 20s, everything's going great. Things do it in the depression where every one third of a nation's out of work, the tenderloin is booming because we not only have our above ground economy with the bars, which people drink during all economic times, but we have our underground economy of prostitution and gambling. So in the midst of the depression, bankrupt San Francisco allocates the equivalent of today's a million dollars, a million dollars in current money 
to hire an investigator to determine whether there's illegal gambling in the tenderloin. It's like that scene in Casablanca where, you know, they, they, they discover the gambling in Rick's, Rick's uh, cafe. So they spend all this money there interviewing people. Sally Stanford, the famous madam who ended up becoming mayor of Sausalito was all involved. And they find out that police are actually taking bribes to allow gambling, which of course was widely known and, and widely understood. Uh, and in fact, one of our former governors, the original governor, Pat Brown, Jerry's father, his father was involved with running an illegal gambling operation in the Tenderloin. So it was, it was one big open secret, but they decided they wanted to close down the Tenderloin. And again, we resisted and the Tenderloin won. And heading into the 40s, we were still booming. And then the next challenge in 1954, we elected, and Kathy, I'm sorry to have to say, he was a Greek mayor, George, Christ George Christopher, very proud of his Greek ancestry, but he, uh, he blamed the Tenderloin for his brother's drug problems. He said that his brother kept getting caught up with Tenderloin type people. So that, that's interesting because his brother was like in Lake Tahoe selling drugs, but nevertheless, so starting even before Christopher in 1954, they say, we have to revive, Chamber of Commerce says, we have to revive downtown. And City Hall says, okay, we'll, we'll help. We'll get rid of all the cable cars in the Tenderloin. So you see a lot of photos in the museum of cable cars going down O'Farrell and Jones. They were removed. Then they decide, you know, there's still too much traffic. Can, there's too many pedestrians in the Tenderloin. We need to make, get rid of the two-way streets and make them one-way streets. Well, so they get rid of the cable cars. Well, they're turning basically the Tenderloin not into a neighborhood, but a through fair to downtown in Union Square. And then Christopher did the coup de grace of the Tenderloin. He stopped police bribery. And many listening will probably think, well, wait, we don't want police being bribed uh, and gambling is supposed to be illegal. And, and I agree with that. But what Christopher did, instead of saying, well, gambling has run the Tenderloin economy forever, and now that we're getting rid of it, we're going to give some support to businesses. He took away their transportation and did nothing to help the struggling businesses who suddenly lost all their gambling and their gambling money. So here we have a neighborhood that from 1907 through 1960 was one of the most prosperous neighborhoods in San Francisco. And in 1960, the census the entire Mission District and the entire Soma District was considered a blighted area. But in the 1960 census, there wasn't one block of the Tenderloin that was considered blighted. And then look how rapidly things changed. The Compton's Cafeteria riots we know about in 1966 and how the Tenderloin became very rapidly decomposed. And it became, it was in a free fall until Kathy and Leroy Looper bought the Cadillac Hotel. So it's a good segue to uh, Kathy's uh, talk about how, how things were when she got here in the 70s. Okay, well, first I'm going to talk about how things were in the 50s, because when I was a, an infant, almost an infant, maybe about four, five, six, seven years old, my father used to take me through the Tenderloin because... There was a large Greek immigrant population down there. And they had social clubs, they had bars, they all went to. Um, and then the final stop on our tour through the Tenderloin used to be the um, Central Market, Grand Central Market, which was right across the street from the Fox Theater. And I got to know the Tenderloin quite well because that was how my father babysat us. Um, by taking us to meet all his friends who were working in the Tenderloin. And my aunt and uncle even owned um, a large hotel on Leavenworth, Leavenworth and Turk. Um, this is now currently owned by a Greek as well. Um, I think he bought it from my aunt and uncle um, back in the 50s. Um, she, they owned that hotel, which I just found out about, which was kind of interesting to me because Apparently, my family has a history in the Tenderloin, and that was like the proof. At any rate, <clears throat> after my father died, I pretty much very, very didn't go in the Tenderloin at all, except to go to the Greek 
um, diner. I can't remember what it was called, but they had a lot of Greek dancing and it was in the old Phil Lear's restaurant, Phil Lear's Steakhouse restaurant. Um, and again, the Greek scene was very vibrant through the early 70s, I think. And then it just died down. I don't know what happened. I wasn't paying attention. But Leroy brought me to the Cadillac in 1975. And he said, you know, I think we want to buy this building. It's so great. It's a phenomenal building. It was four floors, 158 residential rooms. I think at the time there were 11 storefronts. Um, originally, the Cadillac Hotel, which was built in 1907, was only 80 rooms. It had a bedroom and a suite, and it was meant for people who came from out of town and stayed there for a while. Over the years, it changed the use, and it became a hotel for Seabees, for Merchant Marines, for people who were passing through, but not for very long. And when we bought it in 76, there were only 30 rooms that were habitable, and out of those 30 rooms, um, some of them, well, we only had 30 tenants out of 158 rooms. So that's that's how we got into the tenderloin. That's how we, and then we thought, well, what can we do to make it better? So Leroy had this house on Baker Street. He sold the house and we used those monies to upgrade and um, paint and put uh, windows back and put heating systems in. Um, and we rented the rooms out. And we had a halfway house for our federal prisoners on the third floor, 60 residents. And we had basically senior citizens. When we stopped doing halfway house services, reentry services for the Bureau of Prisons, we um, let in more seniors. So it was our hotel is basically a hotel for seniors, for people who are disabled. Um, we have a variety of different storefronts from a doctor's office to um, a women's center to a Head Start program for 40 children, the Tenderloin Museum, and Clean City. And you can say, how did you have 11 storefronts and now you only have a few? Well, we combined the storefronts because most of the Tenderloin storefronts were pretty small originally. So we combined them and that's how we ended up with the ones we have. And it's really been um, a life's journey um, and one that we can't predict, it seems like. we. Originally, before the um, Tenderloin Museum went in, we had a sizzler and we brought a franchise into the Tenderloin. We thought this is going to transform the, the neighborhood. This was the largest investment that anyone made in the Tenderloin in years. We put over a million dollars in that one storefront to make it, um, to be able to get jobs for people who lived in the neighborhood. We, we hired from the neighborhood. We did training and hired from the neighborhood. Um, we had fresh food. The, the typical Sizzler menu was the menu we had. And we did pretty good at the Sizzler until the earthquake came and the recession came and almost everything in the city closed down from the recession and the earthquake. And we did too. And then it became the Tenderloin Museum. So that was my journey. That's my journey in the Tenderloin, Randy. It's, um, it's a long one. And it's a disappointing one right now. I'm very well, I, should, I should I should also mention that, you know, we we had a lot of hopes for the Tenderloin in 1986 when the Sizzler opened. And one of the points yes. Kat was kind enough not to mention was people all thought that the police and the city would protect the Sizzler from the problems on the street that might deter customers. But suddenly Sizzler found itself an island. Yes, we were used to say that um, we would have to helicopter our customers in. It was, um, it was a very discouraging journey. In the very beginning, it was different. People were walking in. People, we got people from City Hall. We got people from the federal building, from the state building. We got people from the courthouses. We got people from downtown. Uh, we got tourists. Um, and it was a vibrant restaurant. What changed was um, when all the encampments happened by Civic Center and by City Hall, and there was aggressive panhandling going on. We had people coming in with garbage bags. 
going to the all you can eat salad bar. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the small garbage cans. I'm talking about those big black utility garbage cans and just dumping food in it and walking out. And um, no one wants to eat in the situation where that kind of stuff is going on. We had literally no foot traffic. And um, that was you know, very just, discouraging. We did expect that the city, knowing this tremendous investment from all kinds of places, primarily the Wells Fargo Foundation, we thought that they would support this and actively participate in keeping the area clean and open and encouraging other businesses to open up. It didn't happen. You know what, what a lot of people uh, who've been following the Tenderloin story, what's going on now, may not be aware is that under Ed Lee, a number of restaurants and people made investments in the neighborhood, whether it be the Black Cat or Onsen Spa or uh, Way 26 Valencia, the La Cocina's coming in. Uh, there was a belief that the neighborhood was gonna be pushed by restaurants, bars, and cultural facilities like the museum and Piano Fight, uh, uh, the dance place on, uh, I'm blanking on the name on Turk Street to move from South of Market. So we had all these uh, positive things. And then suddenly we find in 2019 under Mayor Breed that counterpulse, thank you. Uh, under Mayor Breed, suddenly there's allowing to be about two and almost 200 tents every night. And drug dealing is worse than ever. And it's like, wait, we were on this progress just like we were in 1986. And why isn't the city backing it? And I think what we've seen with the last two months is those of us, and it's virtually everybody, because I talked to owners, I talked to everybody in the Tenderloin, and everybody thought we were on a certain trajectory and that Mayor Breed was on board with where Mayor Lee was and where the whole board of supervisors is, frankly, where every elected official is. But unfortunately, the mayor seems to want to return the Tenderloin to the days of a containment zone, where you take a part of the city and you try to limit the drug dealing and the, the encampments and the tents and the drug use to this one area. And, and that's extraordinarily destructive. And it's not fair to the business owners who've invested their money in reliance on what the city told them they was going to do. I mean, I don't know how this city can claim to be pro-small business when it's trying to aggressively to put every tenderloin business out of business. Well, Randy, I'd like to, I'm not going to speak on behalf of businesses because I'm not involved with them, but I am involved in the lives of my residents and they feel they're being held captive in their rooms. They cannot leave the Cadillac. I have pictures that I've taken, which I've shared with a lot of people that show how if you're in a wheelchair, you can't get by on the sidewalk. You can't go up. You can't go down. Once you get out of the front door of the Cadillac, you're trapped. Um, people who are disabled, who are on walkers, who feel unsafe to walk through things. People who are generally immune compromised, who feel that by walking in shit, they're going to carry that stuff back to their room. They shouldn't have to feel this way. So whereas the mayor may feel that it's okay to let people have tents. Well, I agree. It's okay to have people have tents, but not on our sidewalks, not in the Tenderloin. Not in a residential area that's very dense, that's filled with children. It just doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand how this city feels that this is permissible activity. You know, there was a comment that was made in a meeting of, uh, with Mayor Lee by the former police chief, Greg Sir, that I always think about where there was uh, some people complaining about a shooting that occurred at the corner of Taylor and Turk, which at the time was an out of control area, the worst drug block in San Francisco. And Mayor Lee said he wanted to, uh, he wanted to change that. And Chief Sir said, Mayor, I know the Tenderloin. I used to walk a beat there in 1983 and that's how the Tenderloin has always been. And Mayor Lee said to him, well, I don't want it to be that way any longer. And he, that entire block was cleaned up. And I think there's this mm -hmm. perception, well, the Tenderloin's always been a containment zone. Yes, but it was moving away from that and that and it was prompt the city hall promised to move away from that and it was moving in that direction through 2017 and 18 and then city hall has moved it back and that's what's so disturbing to people what's who benefits from this because we brought in all these residents who are seniors disabled 
kids and we're subjecting them to trauma instead of joy. Okay, let's talk about kids. I have a Head Start program with 40 kids from three to almost five. 40 kids. They have no outdoor space, so they have to go according to the state regulations. They have to walk to a playground. They take them out and they look so adorable. They're so sweet. They're so tiny. They're so cute. They hold on to each other. They have little ropes stringing them together. They have to walk up Leavenworth Street to get to either the Children's Park or Bodecker. And to do that, they have to walk single file through people's tents, through buckets of urine and feces to get to where they're going as a day activity. That's what they have to do. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry, it's ridiculous. This city should not permit, permit tents anywhere in a residential neighborhood. And the, cat, the Cadillac is a residential building. We're surrounded by residential buildings. And the neighborhood is a residential neighborhood. It really is. We may have storefronts on the bottom, but we have tons of people living on top. It's not a place where single family homes are. These are, most of the buildings have, would you say 40 and up in terms of residences? in terms of SRO rooms, Randy, 40 at least, most of them, every building. And, and yet, you know, mentioned, every single person who lives in those buildings has to go through this. If somebody asked what, you know, what was different in the past and everything, and I think people should realize that in 2016, there were not tents on sidewalks in the Tenderloin. No. There had never been the preceding 100 years. Uh, the Tenderloin's problems have been primarily due to drug drug traffic but not tents and that's very different they're different things uh in terms of your ability to navigate streets uh the tenderloin's economy and this is what mayor lee completely understood has always been driven by restaurants bars and entertainment facilities and if you go to our matchbook book i think it's called the matchbook the book that you can get from the museum and listen all the old businesses we had you'll see they're all restaurants, bars, or entertainment venues, and often entertainment in the restaurants. And that's what we were doing coming back to at places like Piano Fight, which is a restaurant, a bar, and an entertainment venue in one venue. Uh, and it's been successful. So why isn't the city building on the success and treating the neighborhood like all other neighborhoods? And that's really the troubling thing is that are, we're all paying the taxes that every other neighborhood pays, but we're not getting the services. And there never was a vote by the Board of Supervisors to make it a containment zone. We know our supervisor of District 6 has been very unhappy, Matt Haney, about what's going on. So it just seems like a, a very undemocratic and we think potentially illegal because there is that lawsuit that's going on that Hastings Law School and others have filed, which I think many see as the only solution right now. If City Hall is violating their own health mandates, the only way to get them to follow the law is court order by a federal court and it's in court right now. I've never seen any real social progress happen that didn't involve the courts. This is the truth. You look at civil rights, you look at all the things that people have fought for. They've always had to go to court for it. So I'm so happy this court case was filed. It just makes it seem like um, it might happen. We might get some recognition from the city. Somebody asked about the, the court filing, and I'll just say that, you know, they've had two days now of settlement talks. Uh, some people are under the misapprehension that this case won't be decided for months. The judge is meeting with the litigants daily. I mean, they're, they're, the, court, the court session has started because this is a, this is a, a pandemic issue. Uh, time is of the essence. Uh, so the court is being very aggressive in trying to get a resolution of this. And we will see how aggressively the city attorney wants to fight for the right to have tents in one neighborhood on sidewalks and not others. And, you know, I often hear from people that said, well, Randy, you know, there's tents in other places, too. And there are. And I drove through the mission. And I saw the tents. It's not there's no block of the mission that even equates to most of the blocks in the tenderloin where you can't even walk down. the. There's not even six foot clearance on the sidewalk. So there's isolated tents. And they're often tents in parking lots and things that aren't blocking the sidewalk. But you don't see anything like this. And the main 
the main sidewalks of the Tenderloin being completely blocked. And that's what this lawsuit is addressing. And you're, we're gonna hear results from this sooner than people realize. Mm, I hope so. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions here um, from the attendees. Uh, I live on Hyde and Ellis and I'm constantly wanting to combine my compassion towards the homeless with my own quality of life. How do we do this? Um, which is pretty similar to a lot of the other questions that are kind of asking, um, you know, what's what's the path forward for housing people? Or also another question was, are there strategies or tactical approaches that we can support to help address the containment zone problem? Well, I'll just mention that the city <laughs> has a thousand hotel rooms that they're paying for and not occupying. I mean, it's interesting. People used to say to me, I don't really get it. What, you're not giving a solution. And we kept saying, well, the lawsuit lists a solution. I mean, it's very simple. You move to supervised tent encampments and hotel rooms. I mean, uh, I don't see them needing a 31 page plan to figure out how to avoid tents on Union Street or Chestnut Street or 24th Street. You don't see that. But somehow, oh, we don't know what to do. We're, we're, just, we're just helpless. They've been breaking up tent encampments for decades. So it's a conscious choice that was made before the pandemic. And we were fighting it then. Uh, and we were hoping to eliminate, alleviate that problem. But now when you have a thousand vacant hotel rooms and thousands others available and huge swaths of land in the city for supervised tenant encampments, I mean, do you realize we just opened up two weeks ago all the golf courses, the public golf courses? And we have people saying to me, where are we gonna put these homeless people in tents? How about the sixth fairway at Harding Park? How about Lincoln Parks? I mean, we have entire golf courses which are really limited to like a very narrow demographic. Yet we're jeopardizing the safety of Tenderloin seniors and children to protect golfers. Doesn't make sense. You want to add to that, Kathy? Yeah, I, I actually drove around the city and I was looking for places that were a little out of the way that was owned by, the, by that was within the district of San Francisco, city and county of San Francisco. I found 20 acre parcels, one 20 acre parcel in San Francisco, which is adjoined by another 60 acre parcel in San Mateo County, right on Geneva and Bayshore. And right on Geneva and Bayshore, across the street is an electrical, um, I don't know what you would call it. It's got a lot, it's an outstation. Um, there's one kind of like um, little corner grocery store. A block away, there's the T-line. Um, so you have transportation. Why can't they lease this property from, it's called Visitation um, Investments, LLC. Lease this property, pave it, have the um, US in Corps of Engineers come and put up some pup tents like Camp Curry, some canvas tents that are above the ground so that people, when it rains, don't get inundated with water or get wet. Humane conditions, just like a Camp Curry situation in Yosemite, where you're in a tent, you're in a bed, you have a bureau, you have supervision, you have food close by, you have supervision, because that's the key for these, these people that are living in the tenderloin is some supervision. You have some counseling tents set up for people to get counseling, um, but they're not in a residential area. Why not? Why not ask for help from the um, Army Corps of Engineers to help set up a situation where we can house people decently? They did it after the earthquake. They you know, did I think it after the earthquake. Yeah, there's also a mythology that's that spread that, well, the people who are in the tents in the Tenderloin are not capable of living in a hotel. And not, not all of them are, obviously. And they, let's, say that, let's say that only half of them are, which is what the city has said. The city has said that over half of them are capable of living without supervision. That's what Jeff Kozitsky has said repeatedely. If that's true, then, then the, we, in, the, instead of 420 tents in the Tenderloin, we should immediately have 210 right off the bat, not even counting supervised encampments. But what's striking, and people should realize how the city has done absolutely nothing, even after we filed the lawsuit, it has not reduced the 10th population at all. 
the Tenderloin Community Benefit District wrote a letter to the city, it seems like over a month ago now, saying, why don't you use the vacant Fulton, Fulton Mall to house Tenderloin tent dwellers? What happened? They didn't do it. The mall was taken over by new tent dwellers, and then they decided to make that a supervised and tent encampment. But they completely uh, avoided moving Tenderloin folks. And we heard that if they ever, the reason they don't want to move Tenderloin tents is they say, well, it's not safe. The CDC says it's not safe, but they're violating distancing now with the sick that it's not safe. So they're, they're violating the law and justifying it by saying they don't want to violate the law. The, the profound dishonesty of what's coming out of City Hall needs more attention. And I want to be very clear to anyone listening. Ask, you say, what can you do? Get your supervisor who's not Aaron Peskin or Matt Haney, who are vocal on this, Get the other nine supervisors to start speaking out because the Tenderloin is part of San Francisco. Actually, I would ask that they get invited to do a walking tour. Yeah, I mean, a this idea that somehow, the yeah, the idea that somehow the other supervisors don't have any role in or any responsibility uh, in a neighborhood where the mayor has decided to turn into a, a, a encampment zone. That's wrong. Yeah, the supervisor to speak out. I want to um, address the mental health issue, which um, can't be addressed that easily, but I want to try. I'm, Leroy and I, when we bought the Cadillac, we, two years later, we bought a, a very large Victorian home um, called the Chateau Laura, which we renamed Chateau Gothic after my daughter. And it's on Guerrero Street off of 20th and Liberty. It's a beautiful place. It was an old mansion that had been condemned, but was being run as a board and care home for the mentally ill. And originally we bought it thinking we could move in with our children, do some renovations and bring it up to code. But when we moved in and met our re the residents who were living there, there was no way we were going to ask them to leave. So we decided to move our family into two rooms. We have four kids two rooms, we lived in two rooms, and we had 27 mental patients living with us. And we ran that place for about 18 years, and it was one of the best experiences of our lives. Um, Art Agnos helped get rid of all the board and care homes in the city. It's impossible to have a board and care home now, but there are a lot of people who are on the streets who are mentally ill who need to be in a supervised living situation where they get three meals a day, where they get laundry cleaned, where they have their medication and someone's watching them to make sure they're taking it. Um, you can't address the homeless issue without even looking at the mental patients or people who are drug addicted without trying to figure out how to deal with those services, how to get them what they need specifically. It's just not a home issue. It's just not putting people in a hotel. It's dealing with the underlying issues that brought them to the streets. And at one time, we did have over a thousand board and care homes throughout the city, but they've all pretty much closed down. There are fewer than maybe 200 beds now, maybe not even that. So you know, the city has to take responsibility for creating a lot of these problems. And let me mention that I see some questions about, you know, there's a view that says, well, the reason all the tents from the Tenderloin is because access to services at Glide at St. Anthony's. You don't need to have a tent in, on Tenderloin sidewalk in order to act, get free food at St. Anthony's or get served, health care at Glide. I mean, we, these, these institutions have lasted for decades and, and without any... Uh, tents and the tenderloins. There's no real causal connection between the tents uh, and, and the notion that people, if they could choose to live anywhere in San Francisco, they would choose to live on a sidewalk on Turk and Hyde is just not credible. And, and, and you know, there was a good uh, ABC report that Dan Noyes did. You could check it out online where he actually talked to a person in a tent who said she's been trying so hard to get housing and she loved it. She's been contacting online and everything and the city doesn't respond to any, any of her inquiries. So here we have a tent dweller desperate to get into housing who's completely coherent and fine and can't get any help. So mm -hmm. this notion that people want to be on the sidewalk is this blaming the victim mentality that people should reject. I saw someone mention they're going to ask a supervisor to give a tour. That's great because I'm disappointed we have these supervisors voted to do this thing with the hotel rooms, but uh, I don't think 
we're hearing enough from the other supervisors. They are city officials for all of San Francisco and, and the mayor needs to hear from them. And we all need to hear their voice. Well, I don't see how people can feel that by putting all this in the tenderloin, they're containing it to the tenderloin. Because as we all know, people go outside of the tenderloin, they go downtown, they shop, they take all whatever they've accumulated with them everywhere they go. And there's no way you can contain a virus. And right now we're in a real state of emergency. Not dealing with this issue is a real problem. It's gonna be a problem for the entire and, city. And that's a great point. The workers in the Tenderloin Housing Clinic, which I had, they, they live all over the Bay Area and they yeah. have to walk to their jobs to get in their Tenderloin hotels, which are open 24 seven, through these lack of social distancing. And it's, it's a danger to all, but for whatever reason, you know, we've had a lot of the media just want to contrast the mayor's response to Bill de Blasio who's done a horrible job in New York and our mayor has done a better job. But they act like these stories you read about San Francisco, you, you get the impression that Tenderloin isn't in San Francisco anymore. We're in some other place. So it's no point talking about it. We're three blocks from City Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually had an interesting question. Um, have there been any other lawsuits in the past? Yeah. Um, or any time when a court order has resulted in improved conditions in the Tenderloin was a question? No. Well, actually, we, there was a lo aggressive lawsuits against property owners for allowing drug mm -hmm. dealers inside their outside their places. And I'm thinking that we, need, we did, I did that in the early 90s with the Adopt-A-Block organization we had. And I'm thinking we need to go back to that. I think in addition to the Hastings soup, you might consider, to, people should be listening and see what they think. Individuals, places, people living at 378 Golden Gate and really high impact areas file small claims court actions against the city for damages. And maybe everyone in the Tenderloin should be filing small claims court actions and let the city attorney spend all the time defending these cases. Yeah. Um you know, we wouldn't have a lot of the drug problems that we have. I mean, I mean, my sidewalks are littered with needles, littered with needles. People, you, you can, I have a picture of someone who's sprawled out with the needle in their arm. They're, they're literally unconscious, but they're sprawled out on the sidewalk with the needle in their arm and surrounded by needles. Um, you can't solve the drug problem in the gender line if you don't go after the drug dealers. The people who live outside of the area who come in and sell drugs to probably what is the most vulnerable population there is in this city. We have to deal with the drug problem too, Randy. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we were actually making some progress on the drug dealers. The federal, the U.S. attorney had come in at 101 High and 101 High was better. All that went by the wayside when the pandemic. And what, if you look at the Turtle Tower incident yesterday, and people should really hear about what happened in Turtle Tower where or, you know, Kathy Pham, one of the most, that's probably the most beloved Tenderloin restaurant. And for them to have to wait two hours for the police to come after they're robbed really sends kind of a message to all business owners that part of being a containment zone is we're not going to really deal with your concerns. Now, I, I have not heard, and I wonder if anyone on this call has heard any response from the police, because I would have assumed that we'd hear what their response is to that two hour wait. Like, how did that happen? Will it happen again? I, has the mayor made a comment? I haven't heard the mayor respond to it. But this is a pretty big deal when one of the signature businesses in the Tenderloin in Little Saigon has to wait two hours for the police after a robbery. Yeah. Well, Randy, we have to wait forever when we put in a 911 call about people fighting or um, breaking windows. Uh, outside of the Tenderloin, we never get a call back. We never get a visit. So two hours is, in my opinion, that's a pretty good response for what the Tenderloin usually gets. We usually don't get that kind of a response. It's true. You can call the police all you want. I actually have passed out flyers in my hotel saying, if you have a problem with street activity outside, if you see people fighting or um, uh, breaking windows or slashing tires, please call this number. And like the more calls they that they get, I'll call them, that's, oh, we've got maybe 10 phone calls about that one thing. But do you think that anyone's ever responded? No. 
And you're across I've been the street. Them my name and number and ask them to call me when they respond. I never get a call back. And you're across the street from the police station. People should realize. I'm across the street from the police station, and they have to turn the corner and go past the hotel to get to the police station, and they don't stop. And um, we have, we're getting a question about um, why you think the Tenderloin has been abandoned by the police. Well, I, I'll tell you, the problem started in 2015 when I described in my book about the redistricting was a big problem. And uh, when they redistricted and created this massive Tenderloin station that includes the Westfield Center, 6th Street, Market Street, UN, all these areas that aren't in the Tenderloin, it just meant fewer officers in the Tenderloin neighborhood as we know it. And we've had fewer officers ever since. And you can't get the chief to change those allocations. They have, they borrow people. So when we had a lot, all these shootings at, at Mark, in front of the Hibernia Bank and Market and Jones, and we have a hotel there, the Boyd Hotel, and we asked for reinforcements, the police, they would transfer someone from Richmond Station who could be there like, I could, they could be there one or two days a week, but not full time. So it didn't provide the police protection that every other neighborhood takes for granted. I mean, what happens with the Tenderloin is the police and the city policy is we're going to allow all these illegal activities. Then we complain about it and they say, well, gee, we're overstretched because you have so many illegal activities in their neighborhood. Where do you think they came from? I mean, it's like people don't know that the reason Golden Gate Park didn't have campers because they were told to move to the Tenderloin. That's where they were in Golden Gate Park. People say it's so pristine in Golden Gate Park. Where do they think those people were told to go to? I know that for an absolute fact. They were told to go to the Tenderloin. This was a few years ago. So that happens all the time informally with police when they're, you know, that's how it is. Well, they've also been told not to um, move the tents. So they've right. been given, people who camp in the Tenderloin know that they're not going to be asked to leave. I can personally go up to people and say, hey, this is what I'm trying to do at the Tenderloin. I'm trying to provide safe housing for vulnerable people. Just like you, I take in homeless people. I have over 100 people who were formerly homeless through the referrals through the mayor's office. And I can ask them politely, please, can you move? Can you clean up this mess so that it's safe for people who live in this hotel? And when they refuse to, I say, well, I have to call the police. I'm sorry, but I'm going to call. And I walk away, I call the police. They're, they tell me they, they'll respond to a homeless encampment in 20 to 30 days. <laughs> That's not going to do me any good. And just to make people feel more hopeful on this call, I, I'm optimistic about this lawsuit. And the lawsuit is not just requesting relief during the pandemic. It's a permanent, it would be a permanent injunction preventing San Francisco from using Tenderloin sidewalks as tent encampments, just like they do for other sidewalks. And so I think that can happen and, and sooner than we may think. And yeah, I, I don't know how the city defends, I don't know how the city defends a position in court and goes into court and says, no, we want to be able to use this neighborhood sidewalks, but no other neighborhoods. Yeah, I wanted to ask, I mean, this is very much in line with what you're talking about. Um, one of the questions is um, moving forward and considering this pandemic um, and this opportunity to reinvent the Tenderloin, what sort of urban plan do you envision for the Tenderloin? Well, you know, we were dealing before the pandemic with pedestrian safety as a big crisis, which, which we know we still have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, and the outdoor eating will be essential. Restaurants throughout San Francisco and throughout the country are not gonna survive without outdoor eating. So we have to figure out a way to make that happen, which will mean slower streets, reducing traffic, all the things a lot of us have been trying to do for a long time. I mean, again, even though we're a residential neighborhood with thousands of kids, we have the most dangerous street, th street, th street fairs in the, in the city. I mean, just zooming through the Tenderloin as if it's a, it's a commercial district and it's not. And so maybe this will help in that regard, and hopefully we can move that. I, I just had written an article for Beyond Cron this week about how there's a big bond to deal with the re, uh, health and recovery, and the Tenderloin doesn't get one dollar from that bond. We need to buy ten million for our pedestrian safety. So here again, all these neighborhoods are getting benefits from this bond, proposed bond, not one dollar allocated to the Tenderloin. That's a failure of city hall leadership, and we that it's just the same issue, the flip side of this containment zone. 
I, I'd like to also address that. I'd like to see businesses that stay for longer are open longer than nine to five. I think it's really important to have businesses that are open in the evenings, um, mainly because foot traffic is really important to keeping um, our sidewalks and streets safe um, and, 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 and accessible to everyone. So I personally would like to see more restaurants have sidewalk um, eating available. We have these huge sidewalks. There's no reason why we can't have it. And there's no reason Larkin Street, Little Saigon, can't be closed down entirely at night for dining. Exactly. Keep those restaurants afloat. So I think that can all that can all happen, but it's not going to happen if we have tents everywhere because no. people aren't going to go to the restaurants. Definitely. Um, well, let's see. There is one question that says, um, you know, the TL being historic red light district. Um, is it time to decriminalize sex work and shouldn't the police focus on violent crimes? If anyone wants to speak. I, I don't think there's, the police are focusing on sex work in the Tenderloin. You know, it's yeah. interesting is that when we were at the height of the brothels in the 1930s, Tenderloin was as safe, safe as neighborhood as it was in America. Yeah. Totally safe. I mean, we were a safe neighborhood from 1907 into the 1960s. I mean, as I say, it, it was, it, so when, when gambling and prostitution were on, were throughout the Tenderloin, very safe neighborhood, very prosperous neighborhood, and the gambling, people came here to gamble, then they went to dinner here, and that's how we supported our, and they go to the movies on Market Street. We had an integrated economy, which we've struggled to regain, but we were on the right track, and I wrote an article at the beginning of, the, beginning of January about all these things happening, this could be a banner year for in 2020. And I don't, it's a mystery to me. It's a mystery to me why Mayor Breed didn't say, hey, the Tenderloin's going in the right direction. Let's keep it moving in that direction and I'll get credit. Instead of saying, Tenderloin's going in the right direction, you know, I'm gonna reverse it. And I'm gonna, everyone mad at me for doing that. I don't get that. Maybe someone can explain the logic of why a politician wants to be getting people mad at her. Randy? When she puts up the $500 million bond for every neighborhood but the Tenderloin, she's telling you what she feels about the Tenderloin. The fact that we're not getting $1 for our, for our community, not $1 for our community out of 500 million says a whole lot. So we're gonna have to do some serious fighting. Yes. Well, we only have about 10 minutes or so. Um, if you guys wanted to make any closing statements or. Well, I, I would just like to say that I think, again, we've, we're have we having to focus on reality, which is very depressing and negative right now. But again, there's a lot of things that are slated to happen. La Cochina's municipal marketplace, hopefully the public marketplace can work in the pandemic era, is still slated to open around September 1st. Uh, Projects are being completed, the Shorenstein apartment building on, on, on Jones and, and Market, things that have been in the works for a long time. There's a number of restaurants opening at Leavenworth and Ellis after a long reserve renovation. So if we could we, we, we turn our sidewalks to where they historically have been and have the outdoor eating, the Tenderloin could be amazing in the, in, in, by the end of the year. But it really depends on it's very difficult without City Hall's cooperation. This is what I'm saying is the theme of this whole event today is City Hall should be working to improve the net tender, all the neighborhoods of San Francisco. Mayor Lee had two staff working full time in the Tenderloin. It made a big difference. They talked to businesses. Now mm -hmm. it's like the only time there's no connection at all. You wouldn't even know we have a mayor connected to the Tenderloin unless she's coming for some photo out. And that has to change. I, I don't quite understand why that has happened, but it is, it's failing the Tenderloin. So people should try to, again, there, is, there, is, there are things could, could be happening positive. We just have the obstruction in trying to convince the mayor to get on the right track. You want to add well, I, like that, I like that last comment. Let's make the Tenderloin fun again. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's so important. Yeah. I agree. Tenderloin is such a vibrant and wonderful place to be. And I'm saying this truly from the depths of my heart. 
it's a shame to see what's happening to it and a shame that we have this kind of neglect politically. Um, and I'm only hoping that we can all get together and um, lobby City Hall to look at our community and ask the supervisors to stop being, have their heads up their ass all the time, um, only advocating for their own districts. We gotta have every supervisor working to make the Tenderloin a better community. Every single one. They need to stop just paying attention to their neighborhood and start paying attention to, the, to ours. We take so many of their problems it's only right that we be seen as part of the whole instead of just a small part of the city. Yeah, I think that's, um, there's, yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, there's one last question, I think, which is a great note to end on. Uh, what can neighbors and residents do to send a clear message that change in the TL is necessary to the mayor and the board of supervisors in both of your opinions? Well, make sure to contact them because people often feel it's hopeless. What's the point of calling? They know they need to be contacted. They, they, they track all these things. And so, especially if you live in, if, if you're on this call and you live in the Richmond, contact Sandra Fuhrer, tell her to do something, tell her to speak out, tell her it's part of her responsibility. Go to all the districts that, uh, that where you live and, and, it, it does make a difference because they don't hear from a lot of people these days. So if they're mm -hmm. getting a lot of volume of complaints about the Tenderloin, it does sink in for both the mayor and the soups. Well, um, I'm just going to say that personally, I just want to go down there and start screaming, but I know that's not an effective way of communicating with the board of supervisors or anybody at city hall. But I, I really do feel that it's important for us all to get together and, and work on behalf of make, to make this a better community. Um, we can't do it on our own. We have almost exhausted ourselves just trying to deal with what's outside our doorsteps. We need um, a force. We need, we need people to join us outside of our community. And again, just having a containment zone in the tenderloin doesn't mean that you're containing anything other than the visible problems. Those other problems spread throughout the city. It will affect everyone. Um, yeah, it's, it's, our neighborhood is vital to the city and um, we need everybody's help. And if Randy you're able has to- a great, Randy has a great um, outreach team. He's got a good uh, community organizer. I would suggest that you get in touch with Randy's group and um, try to figure out how to do what you need to do, um, even if it is just writing a letter or um, making phone calls or whatever. It's important that they hear from people outside of the Tenderloin because they do hear from us. They just don't hear from everybody else. And be sure if you are able to, to provide any support you can at the Tenderloin Museum for making these kind of events possible. And follow the other Tenderloin Museum. They've got a lot of great events. I don't know if Katie want to mention any particular that are coming up, but a lot of great stuff going on virtually. Uh, yeah, we have, um, we're going to be doing a bunch of virtual uh, neon and historic uh, tour front, storefront tours um, online uh, coming up in the end of May and June. So look out for those. Um, follow us on our social media. I can put a link in the chat as well. Um, if anyone has any questions, I put my email in the chat. Please follow up with me. Um, thank you so much to everyone who attended and to our panelists. Um, I think we'll uh, <laughs> we'll call it a day unless you guys had any uh, further remarks. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Don't forget to be honey badgers. We got we need we need honey badgers. All right. That's great note to end on. Um, thanks both to, so, to both of you so much. Thanks to everyone who watched. Uh, stay safe. Katie, someone said honey badgers. <laughs> honey badgers don't quit. Honey badgers go for the gut. They just won't stop. We need people who are like that. We need you to be warriors on our behalf. Okay, thank you. Now the Tenderloin Borders, Mission and Market Street is sheltered by Knob Hill. It's got a great history, survived the California gold rush.